So yesterday was a great opening general session. We rocked it out with American authors, we laughed with Seth Meyers, we saw some amazeballs and software demos, and... Good morning and welcome. And especially to those that made the long hike and trek from the Yacht Beach, Beach Club, I appreciate you coming here. We live in wonderful times. No matter how we slice it or dice it, our lives are longer, our health is better, the technology is great, poverty is down, hostility is worse. Smarter workforce is about improving the health <coughs> to be able to reach their maximum potential. Smarter workforce truly is about one plus one equals three. And along those same math lines, the crew and I took up a little collection backstage. We're going to get Rudy a I'm going to talk to you about talent, uh, about one of a kind talent that we all want to work with, like my chess playing canine friend here, and how to attract, how to cultivate, and ultimately how to retain uh, the best talent in the world. I'm going to draw heavily on this book, The Talent Mandate, which was written by the global CEO of a boss, a man named Andrew Bennett, uh, that involves conversations and a global survey with business leaders from every a lot of talk about T-shaped workforces. People have deep expertise in some area, but you want them fluent in enough different languages within your company that they can learn and get a perspective and a vested interest in the outcome of every business decision the company makes. If they don't move within the company, they'll move out of it to grow. They are looking for new experiences, they're looking for new dance partners, and that should be you, that should be your firm. Don't be stingy with recognition and rewards. Uh, recognition and rewards, number one reason people leave jobs according to the Department of Labor is because they don't feel appreciated. Interestingly, when you look at survey after survey, it's actually not about money. It's not about compensation, unless you're a hop. It is largely driven by three things. And this is interesting. Do I get to do what I'm best at? Do I feel like the company has helped me realize my potential? Is what I'm doing important? And does my boss care? Does my boss care? That has huge implications for managers. Stop trying to be a manager and be more of a mentor, be more of a coach. Walk around. The walk around management, flatter organizations, those are the companies that are taking over the world. Support a healthy life-work balance. Uh, this is harder to do, again, because of the phones in our pockets, because of what's happening with technology. Uh, work can be an email at midnight on a Saturday, which we all compulsively check. So as a company, as people thinking about talent, thinking about the people that you work with, sometimes you have to really get in front of that. There are some companies now instituting red zones where if hours start to go through the roof, people are put on forced vacation. They're not just encouraged, they're actually mandated to take breaks. How do we all take the, the best and most motivated workforce in the world and make sure there's enough balance that they don't burn out and they don't feel trapped by their own success and end up leaving? Uh, for life reasons, when in fact, with the right balance, uh, it, would be, it would be a perfect marriage. Uh, boost the career trajectories. Uh, this is key. A lot of this is about training, uh, but again, a lot of this has to do with movement and cross-pollinization and maximizing people's opportunities. Uh, so don't skip on training. It's absolutely key, but it's not just traditional classroom, on-the-job training, learn the next skill. Uh, it could be something completely unexpected. Uh, send people to space camp, uh, send them to a conference, send them to a TED conference, uh, get them stimulated. It's important to remember that right now, more than ever, this is the era of an idea economy. And in an idea economy, interesting employees become interested employees. If you keep them motivated and they're getting something out of being there, because you need something from them, they want something from you, they want to learn. That's the ticket. Live what's next. Uh, being the best at one thing is no longer enough. This is about hybrid talent. Again, this is about cross-colonization, this is about a T-shaped workforce, and this is about getting in front of what's new and staying ahead of trends, staying ahead of technology, and sharing that internally. Internal comms are so important here. You really want hybrids. Those are the people who can get any job today. This is a source. It's half zebra, half horse. They could get a job anywhere. That is really what's happening in the workforce. Uh, in our industry, a very talent-driven industry, the people at the middle of their careers who have moved around between different agencies and collected experience in social 
and digital and traditional branding and innovation. In five days, they get five job offers. That's the state of the talent. There's an un unemployment crisis over here, but a lot of idea-led industries, there's not enough talent to go around, and that's what we're up against. So to maximize innovation, hire for passion and agility. Talent's a mindset, not just a skill set. That passion is key. It's more important than category experience. Harness the digital. Don't need to talk about this too much with this crowd. Internet's more than 15 years old. Let's embrace the bandas. Let's just get on with it. Uh, it's really, really important to uh, stop being so digitally self-conscious. And a number of companies still are, the way they use technology, the way they talk about it. Uh, this is a great quote from the futurist William Gibson. One of the things our grandchildren will find quaintest about us is that we distinguish the digital from the real. In the future, that will become literally impossible. We know this, we feel this, we see this every day. Last and most importantly, make it mean something. People want to be part of something larger than themselves. That can be bringing humanity back to air travel. That can be building a smarter planet. That can be making a cleaner bar of soap. Whatever it is, people want to get behind something. 94% of managers around the world agree, never underestimate the value of value. This is about shared values. Again, people want to feel the externalized soul of the company. They want to feel part of something bigger. What do you stand for? How do you communicate that? It could be a humble ambition or a, a huge ambition, but it needs to be a shared ambition. So that's some of the things we're talking about and some of the things we've tried to apply in our world. And I'm going to leave you with three quick thoughts to wrap this up uh, that hopefully summarize the, the, the heart of this. If you do all these things, it gives you permission to behave culturally in certain ways. Reward failure. Uh, people need to feel safe. They need to feel like they can take chances. Again, you want those ideas. You want them thinking about this when they get up in the morning. So it's okay to take chances and fail. In fact, you might want to incentivize people around that. A lot of new tech companies are doing that. This guy hadn't broken his leg, but Wright Brothers never would have gotten off the ground. That's the mentality that you need inside your company. Build a growth culture. Again, get everybody thinking across the company, having them vested both from a compensation standpoint and a motivational standpoint in how the company itself is doing. And stay curious. If you think you have it all figured out, you're doomed. The key to a motivated workforce is to have them learning all the time, have them curious about the world around them, and them coming to you with new ideas and new questions. And if we do that, we'll have a happy workforce, a happy company, and we can all live happily ever after. Thank you. And Run P is a deal where when the movie starts, you press a button on your phone, and it tells you when it's safe to go to the restroom, because nothing important is going to happen in the movie. <laughs> it's a true story. It's totally awesome, and it was the app of the year last year in Pregnancy Magazine. <laughs> it's true. It's totally true. So, <laughs> Run P is actually owned by Dan Florio and his mom, and they actually live right here in Orlando. And they watch every movie the day it comes out, they take really, really copious notes, and they figure out the P times, which is, you know, whatever. So, uh, I actually included a case study about Run P in my new book, uh, Utility, and, and since then, uh, AMC incorporated into their app, which is a big win for, for Dan and his mom, so that's pretty cool. <laughs> Keith Wiedenkeller, who is AMC's former chief people officer, will show us how AMC Theater makes sure. Thank you, Jay. Uh, thanks for having me here. As Jay mentioned, uh, I'm the chief people officer, or was until recently chief people officer for AMC Theaters. Uh, one of the nation's largest motion picture exhibitors, tied for number one spot in terms of revenues. We've got theaters all over the country, been around for almost 100 years. And AMC is, uh, is really the kind of company that I want to work for. And, uh, and that's why I stayed there for 29 years. Having said that, I don't pretend to be an expert. I'm not a guru. I don't have all the answers when it comes to job fit. Really, um, I'm just here to tell you a little story. A story uh, about an industry where turnover rates over 200% are commonplace. A story about an industry where service is not really the, really the hallmark of that industry. An industry that is under increasing competitive pressure. It can't be done, and believe me, this is no, no disrespect to the trainers in the room. I'm a former trainer myself. 
Training can improve almost anyone. But I'm five foot eight. I can train all I want. I'm never going to play in the NBA. So our hypothesis was we need to develop a scientific process. A scientific process to figure out out of the 1.6 million applications we get a year, how can we find those crew members that <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and it's, it's very nice to hear Keith's um, story, and it's very nice to actually have a fairy story with a happy ending, isn't it? Um, so congratulations to AMC, and you know, I think what he was talking about, which I'm going to be touching on today, um, is a lot about this revolution that's Donald's with my clients and customers, I'm out of business, and that will allow me to either take share or be disintermediated. Number one concern about technology. Number two, um, concerned about security, trust, and reputation coming from technology. And number three, interestingly enough, I have to find a way of getting my people in the organization to behave in a way that inspires my customers and how I use technologies of engagement to do so. So we actually found for the first time ever technology the number one strategic imperative. Customer is not surprising, but also really fascinating, a much higher priority on people and culture and engagement. No surprise in a world where brand is so transparent um, and so easy to see through and so indistinguishable from our people and organizations. So, this is a massive shift in the world. These intersecting forces, right, mobile, social, um, digital, are massive and the data that underpins them and their capability. So, like all big shifts, I would posit that it's changing our world in ways that at first would seem paradoxical. And I'd like to just take you through a few thoughts today for you to really hook off as you think about what do we do about this world around humanity. So for years, technology was about automating, productivity, efficiency, cold clinical engineering. Not anymore. It has become the path to intense personalization. I'll give you an example of one of my, cli my clients, um, IBM Interactive, which is part of my organization. It's the fifth um, largest digital agency in the US integral part of our consulting organization, we build the Masters app. For those of you that haven't looked at it, go and have a look at the Masters app. It is absolutely beautiful. And he talked to me about the fact that he enjoys the Masters more because he has the app by his side with its beautiful music and its 360 degree views and its streaming and his ability to analyze what's going on in the shots. That technology makes the human experience learn about groups of customers Customers about amend and adapt to individuals. Contextualize the data, giving a richer, more personal view. Very powerful. Beautiful design. Second point, social networks aren't just for socializing. They are the engine of this, are engines of trust in this world of more human and personalized relationships. And they'll define who chooses what. So, as I mentioned earlier, in every executive, in every organization, we're seeing this as CEOs are trying to open up their organization. You heard it mentioned earlier. I, I have been in consulting all my life. Um, I would say 20% of CEOs will talk about flattening the hierarchy, more collaborative environments, and really mean it. I would say that has shifted to 60 to 70%. Who really believe that unless they get at that engagement, their brand, will not prevail because brand behavior is becoming indistinguishable from employee behavior. And you can't prescribe great behavior, right? You can't prescribe engagement, trust, and liking. You've got to get people to choose to do that. So we're seeing a lot more work around culture and values as our, our organizations are thinking about how do I get a great brand to be pervasive in the hearts of my people, right? And if you start to think about that, it has a lot of implications for what gets done in organizations, right? So firstly, starting to shift the paradigm from being customer-centric to customer-activated. From not just listening to your customers and talking to them, but actually having them influence your entire strategy and way of working. We saw this in Bredesco in, in, in Latin America. You might think about that as fast cycle discovery or fail fast, right? Where the gap between the strategy at the top of the organization and the execution needs to be much quicker, much tighter. So one obvious implication on this premise, right, is that there's hardly going to be any gap between strategy, analytics, the design of business models, 
and their implementation. That cycle will change and will become quicker for most CEOs and most companies. And so in this world that we're entering where this design and analytics becomes a de facto part of business strategy, we are making an announcement today. Five years ago, we saw the imperative of, for fact-based, data-driven enterprises. And we announced the um, start of a business analytics practice, which has grown um, and became a market leading practice in business analytics for IBM. Today, we're launching another practice, which we're calling IBM Interactive Experience. This is a first of its kind consulting practice, not just for us, IBM, but for this industry. It anticipates the premium that our clients are going to place on new models of engagement with all relevant audiences, from us in the room, customers, employees. This global practice will integrate the leading design capabilities and user experts from our IBM Interactive, which is our top five digital agency, our customer experience lab, with more than 100 data experts from IBM Research. IBM Interactive is what delivers the amazing mobile and web experiences of many of the world's major sporting events, as well as of our key commercial clients. And our customer experience lab is all about the transformation of the front office and using data and experience for individualization and personalization over 90 engagements. And we only started it last July. Over 90 engagements, the majority of which are with line of business CXOs. So what we're doing is we're putting those into one integrated capability, adding them to our, into our strategy and analytics service line, which we created earlier this month, which integrates strategy and analytics as the basis. As we're sitting down, take us back a couple of years and tell us how Open Pediatrics got its start. Well, as you heard in the video, um, like a lot of innovation, it was driven by a particular case. Um, but as I begin discussing about this, uh, the project, one of the things I want to communicate is that um, my problems, although they seem <laughs> Thank you to the IBM Social Business team. You can see more about social business and social analytics in the solution showcase in the uh, social business area. Thank you to them. Amazing software that they've got going, tracking all the real-time participation here at the show. Now that we have solved that great mystery, at least on next year, I'm going to recount. Let's turn our attention to another mystery, the mystery of success. Now, not only does everybody know Scott Adams as the creator of this guy, he is also the author of a new book, How to Fail at Almost Everything and Still Win Big. What you may not know, or maybe even expect, is that Scott Adams is a failure. You've heard the saying, he's failed too many times to count. He's way past that. He's failed so often, he actually kept count of his failures, as you'll see in just a moment. In this presentation, you'll learn a lot about failure, but you'll learn even more about success. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce to you the author and creator of Dilbert, Mr. Scott Adams. seen a Dilbert comic strip. <laughs> well, if you've seen the Dilbert comic strip, then you know what failure looks like. Uh, but today, I'm going to give you a template for success. Um, I would like to warn you in advance that you should not take any advice from cartoonists. Well, luck can be manipulated. Well, sort of. I'll explain that. Uh, first, a little context. I have failed many times, 36 times that I counted, and that's just in the business realm, right? <laughs> if I gave you my personal failures, that would be a whole other presentation here. I'm going to show you, show them quickly. I don't want you to dwell on them, uh, but they range from failures in uh, real estate, physical businesses, internet businesses, startups. I've got intellectual property failures, uh, movies, television shows that didn't work out. Got just about every kind of failure. I don't have time to talk about all of them, so I'll tell you one of my favorite, more embarrassing ones. When I was about 20, I had an idea for an invention. It was a brilliant idea, I thought, and it was a combination of a rosin bag that would attach to a, a tennis player's shorts 
so that they could dry their hand between points so it wouldn't slip on the racket. And I thought, this is a brilliant idea. So I took it to a patent attorney, and I showed him my idea, and he sat across the desk and he stared at me silently for a while, and then he spoke rather slowly, because I think he thought that I needed that. <laughs> and he explained it this way, just because you can attach two existing products with Velcro, that does not make it an invention. So although that invention failed, as many of my other projects did, I did learn a lot about intellectual property uh, in that process, which has served me well in, in many other areas in life. And so too, all the other failures, they all had something to teach me. So while they didn't work, uh, I found that just about 10% of the things that I've tried has worked out really well. Now, as it turns out, because most of the things I tried were sort of high-risk, high-reward types of things, you would really expect most of them wouldn't work. But a few of them did. Uh, one of them was this, the Dilbert Cup. Uh, wearable, wearable computing is the next big thing. This is my prototype of a neckless computer. Prepare to be shocked. Did you just talk him into wearing a remotely controlled shot collar? People think I have no goals. So, so speaking of goals, a um, hundred years ago, when things were simple, goals made a lot of sense, right? So if you were a farmer and you said to yourself, uh, I think I need to clear 40 acres pocket today, then the farmer's entire operation so in this context of today, where everything's changing, you know, your life is changing, at the same time the environment is changing, having a goal is sort of like being on a horse that's galloping with a bow and arrow, you're trying to shoot at a target that's somewhere off in the forest, in the fog, the target is also moving at the same time, and you only brought one arrow. <laughs> now sometimes you'll hit that target. It means if enough people with enough horses shoot enough arrows, somebody's going to hit a target, right? And that person will write a book and say, goals, it's a good thing I had a goal. Right? <laughs> but the odds are not that good. The odds of hitting that target in this complicated world where everything is changing at the same time. Another problem is that when you're focusing on your goal, and really that's the whole point, right? If you have a goal, you're focusing on it. Otherwise, what would be the point? But while you're looking at it, Maybe there's stuff out here that you're not looking at that could have been better than whatever your goal was. So you might be missing a whole bunch of stuff that are great opportunities you just didn't notice. So given these limits of goals, what's better? What's better than a goal? Well, I would recommend a system. And I'll define a system this way. So it's something that you do on a regular basis that improves your odds but not in a way that it has a specific goal. In other words, your odds of success are better, but you don't know exactly where this is heading yet. And importantly, and this is really the key to it, you want to make sure that your personal value is increasing even if your projects are failing miserably. Because in the long run, that improvement in your value and the odds are going to work out well. Let me give you some examples of a system versus a goal. When I was in high school, I had a friend, Manuel. Manuel and I both liked girls, and we both wanted to have girlfriends. But we had two very different approaches to this. Uh, I had what I would call sort of a goal-oriented approach at the time. I would, pick, I would pick a specific girl that I thought I wanted to make my girlfriend, and I would spend months trying to figure out how to, how to run into her accidentally and find out where her friends are, what interests she had. And after my months of planning and preparation, usually I would discover that one of three outcomes were possible. Number one, she would say, I have a boyfriend. Number two, she would say, I do not like you. <laughs> but sometimes, and this is the important part, Sometimes, and it didn't happen a lot, sometimes she would say, I have a boyfriend and I don't like him. <laughs> so, um, 
on the plus side, I did not contribute to teen pregnancy whatsoever. <laughs> My friend Manuel had a completely different approach. He had more of a systems approach. He would go into a room full of women, and he were girls, and he would say to each one of them, would you like to be my girlfriend? Or my, yeah, would you like to be my girlfriend? Or worse to that effect. And of course his failure rate was tremendous, but because of the law of numbers, he would uh, usually find somebody who would say yes. But this isn't a story about just the law of numbers. That, that part is somewhat obvious. What was interesting is that every time Manuel went to, through his process, he was learning a skill. He was learning uh, which uh, pickup lines were working best. He was kind of doing A-B testing on, on these girls. <laughs> and, and he was also learning to take rejection. So that no matter what happened, he was becoming more valuable as it went. Here's another example. I've got a friend who was my tennis partner who uh, had a process that I've never seen before. He would interview for jobs that he didn't want. Right, they would be jobs that paid substantially less than he was already making, or jobs that had unpleasant commutes. There were things he would never take, even if offered to him. But he worked at home in, in a technology job, and so this allowed him to network, to meet people he wouldn't have met otherwise. And he also used it as practice. Right, so every time he went to an interview, he became better at selling himself. One day, about a month ago, he said, I won't be able to play tennis with you every Wednesday because I went into this job interview for yet another job that I knew I didn't want. And at the end of the interview, the interviewer said, well, you're totally overqualified for this position, but the head of the department left, you'd be perfect for that job. So that's the job he took with a huge promotion. That's a system over a goal. He didn't go in there for that job, but he increased his odds every time he followed his system. Here's another way to do it easily. Um, there, are, there are a number of skills that I would call complementary skills that you can kind of layer on top of whatever else you're doing. Uh, for example, I took the Dale Carnegie course to learn how to do this. If you add public speaking to anything that you're doing already, you're probably a candidate to be the boss at some point just because you've got that little extra skill. And you're probably thinking to yourself, I can never do that, I don't want to be a public speaker. Trust me, everyone in the Dale Carnegie course, and I'm not selling that, I'm just using that as an example. Uh, they were all bad speakers, they all became good speakers. All of this is learnable, but you don't have to be the world's best at any of this stuff. You just have to have a working facility with it, and it automatically will double your, your odds just because you've got these extra layers. Now how good do you have to be at any of this stuff? Well, let me give you an example using myself. Um, you may have noticed that I am not a good artist. <laughs> uh, I'm a mediocre artist at best. Um, I never took a writing class. Um, I can get my points across fairly clearly, but I'm not a great writer by any stretch of the imagination. If I have a party in my house, I'm not even the funniest person in my own house. All right? I'm funny enough, but I'm not the world-class funniest person who ever lived. I know a little bit about business, but obviously you can see from my 36 failures, I don't know a lot about business. I'm not the best business person in the world. But when you combine those four skills that I've tried to improve through practice over the years to the point of being eh, pretty good, together those just pretty good skills created the Dilbert Empire that's in 2,000 newspapers in 65 countries. Here's another example, um, more from your personal life. Uh, between, it's the difference between a diet um, goal and a system. All right? Again, I, um, I warn you not to take any health advice from cartoonists. <laughs> Bad idea. Uh, these are simple examples of a goal versus a system. All right, your, your goal might be, I want to lose 10 pounds, right? I'm going to use my willpower. I'm going to uh, resist the cookie, resist the cookie. Uh, it's hard. And every one of you knows the people who, who try to use their willpower to lose 10 pounds, a system might be, for example, uh, that you try to replace your need for willpower, which science has now shown, is a finite resource during any given day. 
if you use up your willpower trying to resist eating, you'll have no willpower left to resist whatever else bad temptations you've got. So if you could replace willpower with something else, such as knowledge, that'd be a good thing, right? So this is the system I use. Let me give you an example of how you can replace willpower with knowledge. Uh, you probably all know that uh, vegetables are more healthy than cake, right? So everybody knows a little bit about food. But let's say you went to the salad bar and you had a choice between pasta and a white potato, all right? And you wanted to uh, watch your waistline. And let's say you like them about equally well. How many of you, by a show of hands, would pick the pasta? How many of you would pick the potato? How many of you don't want to raise your hands because you would be embarrassed by the answer? <laughs> All right, the answer is pasta. Pasta has a much lower glycemic index. And so it is that if you learned as much as you could about food, simply knowledge would allow you to make choices that would help you um, not need willpower. So if you go to the salad bar and pick the potato, I pick the pasta, you get fat, I don't. You say to yourself, man, that cartoonist, he's got a good me metabolism, does he? Yeah, but that won't be the case. All right, now you can also replace knowledge, or replace willpower with knowledge, by simply learning over time, and this is going to take a long time, which types of flavorings you can put on this god-awful healthy food to make it not so awful. So maybe it's the soy sauce, maybe it's the mustard, maybe you salt it a little bit more. And eventually, the quality of that cookie up here, which is delicious, isn't so much better than the healthy food that you're learning over time, had the flavor and season until the need for willpower is diminished. Third thing is that cravings are easily unchanged. So you probably think that your cravings for the thing that's your weakness, oh, that chocolate, uh, I can't can't resist that. You probably think that that's somehow baked into your DNA. But I would, uh, you know, point out that the people in India eat Indian food and the people in China eat Chinese food, which I believe they call food. Uh, <laughs> and none of this stuff is baked into you. So I can't get into the, the details of how you would change your craving, but I will tell you that it has to do with knowledge and technique and has nothing to do with willpower. Similarly, with exercise. You might have an exercise goal that is to run 10 miles a week or run a marathon, right? You need your willpower. No pain, no gain, you think? But I don't think people thought that through because really anything that hurts you and is painful and is unpleasant, over time you're going to figure out a reason not to do it anymore. All right? So it's like the dog who touches the electric fence, like, ow, 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 maybe I won't do that anymore. <laughs> so instead of hurting yourself, how about a system? And again, I'm not recommending this, it's just an example of a goal versus a system. You could try to replace your need for willpower to exercise with habit. Now a habit can be, uh, can be built simply by doing something on a daily basis, uh, every day, because that's what causes habit, and giving yourself a reward at the end. So here's what I do. I consciously underdo it, all right? If I know I could run three miles today, if I really tried, but it's gonna hurt and I won't be able to do anything tomorrow, I don't do that. I just run two miles, all right? So every time I'm done exercising, and sometimes it's just walking the dog, because maybe I just don't have it in me that day, I feel good. My energy is lifted, and that's really the game. You're trying to lift your energy, right? And once your energy is lifted, at the end of it, maybe you give yourself a delicious protein shake, a nice cup of coffee, whatever, whatever it is that you like, and eventually you train yourself, like the dog, to um, want to exercise more than you don't. The people who exercise every day have already figured this out. If you're trying to exercise three to four times a week, you probably hate it, all right? If you bring it to seven, but don't kill yourself, it becomes a habit, and I can tell you that at 11 a.m. every morning, my foot starts tapping and my body just wants to go do something because I've trained myself, like my dog, to, to do this thing on a regular basis. Here's another little uh, hack for exercise. I learned this uh, when I was learning to be a hypnotist. So I took courses in hypnosis and here's one of the little tricks they taught us. You know there's those days you come home and you want to exercise and 
you have time for it, but you just don't have the energy, you're just drained, it just can't happen today, try this. Put on your exercise clothes. Just put on your footwear that you're going to use for running, put on your clothes, and just walk around your house for a little while. What you'll find is that the association of the clothing, and just how it feels on your body, will trigger the subroutine in your head that brings up that energy and brings you into the exercise frame of mind. It works about 70% of the time, I think you'll find. Um, so summarizing what a system is, if you've got a system for your diet and a system for your exercise, that's going to increase your energy. Every study shows that if you've got uh, better energy, you're going to perform better on tests. Everything about you is going to be better. You'll have more charisma when you walk into the room. These are all good things. And uh, once your energy is up, then you can take on all of these projects. Individually, these projects might be gigantic failures. But collectively, each of them might teach you something that is increasing your odds over time towards success. So while your personal value is going up, you're learning more things, your odds are going up, is that enough? And is that enough to get you to success? I would say probably not, right? You need more than that, more than a system. What about passion? Do you need that? Well, ask any billionaire. They all say it, passion. Right? You, you interview a billionaire and they say, passion is the secret to success. You've got to have passion. But what else could they have said in public that wouldn't make them sound like jerks? Right? <laughs> what are the other things you can say? Well, I'm smarter than poor people. <laughs> no. right? You can't say that. Uh, you can't say uh, I did some insider trading and that got me started. You can't say I was lucky because that ruins your mystique. There's nothing you can say. I had a boy who has passion. He said he's in it for the wrong reason. The one you want is the grinder. The guy who comes in with a spreadsheet, he says, I'm thinking about opening a dry cleaning uh, franchise. These numbers look really good. I'm going to work really hard. I've got some relevant experience. That's the guy you want to give the loan to. So I said this to my friend. I was talking to him about the uh, the overvaluing of passion. And he said, no, nah, there's no way I'm believing that. Passion has got to be important. He goes, look at the, the winners of American Idol, all right? Those people had to have passion. Obviously, they had passion, because you couldn't get to that level without a lot of passion. I said to him, have you watched the entire season where in the first few episodes, they show entire stadiums full of people who are all very passionate? If you win by the numbers, you would have to say that passion is more correlated with abysmal failure than with success. <laughs> in, in fact, I would go so far as to say that the formula for success, whatever that might be, you could probably pick out passion, that variable, and everything would be just about the same. All right. So instead of passion, think of it in terms of boosting your personal energy. You want to be physically and mentally alert and energetic and willing to take on stuff, power through the things you need to. That's not really passion, which is a little bit irrational. But physical energy is a good thing if you're working with a system. Now, I'm double mugging because I heard that passion is necessary for success. By 4 p.m. I'll be so passionate I'll be dating my chair. <laughs> Nothing about that sounded right. <laughs> Alright, so if passion isn't the key, what is? How about luck? You know, luck is kind of the elephant in the room, right? There is no such thing as someone who is successful without this big honking piece of luck, including me. Alright? I, I don't have time to tell you all the lucky things that happened with Dilbert, but I will tell you there were a lot of unlucky things that happened with the things that didn't work out. But luck, you can't really control it, right? It's like lightning. You know, lightning does what lightning's going to do. Hit you where it doesn't hit you. Isn't that true? Well, kind of. But if you wanted to get hit by lightning, it would help to go outdoors um, in a rainstorm. And if that wasn't enough, because it really isn't, you could go on top of a mountain. You could hold a, a lightning rod. And if one lightning rod is enough, you could plant a whole bunch of freaking lightning rods, network them together, hold on to one, and wait for it to rain. Because you can't 
directly control luck, but you can certainly move from a game that has bad odds to one that has better odds. All right? A researcher named Dr. Richard Wiseman studied luck and lucky people, and he was trying to find out if there's any such thing as luck. Of course there isn't. But he did discover an interesting thing. He found that people who considered themselves lucky, people who feel like luck is going to find them, had a wider field of perception. Not vision, but just what, what they perceived. They would literally notice opportunities that other people wouldn't notice because they weren't expecting any opportunities to be there. And here's the cool thing. He found that you could take someone who thought they were unlucky and just make them do kind of uh, positive thinking exercises. It didn't matter if it was affirmations or prayers. It, the technique didn't matter so much. It was just if they got their mindset that luck was out there, if they would just look for it, they would actually notice more things. Right? So, if you have a choice between a goal and a system, if it's a simple situation that's very predictable, goal might be fine. But in the complicated world where you're looking at where's my career going, what's, what do things look like next year, very unpredictable. Maybe you need a system to boost your odds overall so that luck can find you. Passion, a little bit overrated, but definitely work on your health and your energy. If you don't have that, it's going to be tough to get anything done. Luck, can't manage it directly, but you can change the game. All right, I'm going to take you out on four different comics. Um, some of them have actually something to do with this content. Um, what is the key to success? Hire the right employees. How do you know you hire the right ones? You know because the business is successful. So the key to success is circular reasoning? Yes, because circular reasoning is the key. <laughs> and finish the project that would normally require 10 programmers. Um, did I just establish a new baseline expectation that will turn my job into a tragic death march? It's time to set some stretch goals. Stupid, stupid, stupid. <laughs> Experts say lazy employees are the best because they know how to find shortcuts. So you found a lot of shortcuts? Me? No. I'm not lazy, I'm useless. <laughs> then why did you bring it up? Why wouldn't I? I'm not lazy. <laughs> this last comic has nothing to do with anything. It's just my favorite comic of all time. Thank you very much for listening. I hope there's something I said here that's useful for you. I'll go out on this one. My boss says we need some Unix programmers. I think he means Unix, not Unix. <laughs> I already know Unix. If the company nurse drops by, tell her I said Unix. <laughs>